Minnesota. And today I'm going to talk to you about keeping orchids in your home. Uh, they're a very popular plant these days, and uh, you can buy them almost anywhere. So we thought it'd be appropriate to uh, talk about how to take care of one when you, when you bring it home. I actually have a lots of titles for this presentation. Uh, Orchids in the home is for today. But another one I have is I have an orchid. Now what? You know, you get them as a gift um, and you've got this thing in your house and it's blooming and now it's done blooming. So now what do I do? And my third presentation I have on this for this title is Beautiful Orchids, How Do I Get One and Not Kill It? Which is what happens when most people bring their orchids home. After a while, uh, the orchid eventually dies. The picture you see here is a picture of, a, of an orchid. It's a dendrobium style orchid uh, that I took over on Kauai in one of the botanical gardens, beautiful plant. So today, my presentation objectives are to promote an interest in orchids in the home, and Minnesota particularly, since we have some unique environmental issues. And if you don't have orchids, convince you to try it, you'll like it. They're fun. If you've tried orchids and weren't successful, well, maybe I can give you some ideas for better success on your next orchid. And if you have orchids, maybe I can give you a few new insights and how to take care of your orchids that will make you successful. The keeping orchids is not difficult. It's just a little different. So I'm gonna to talk to you about orchids a little bit and we'll talk about how to select an orchid because that's key and the basic care of an orchid. And there are some resources. It's a handout which will be emailed to you after the presentation. Now, the orchid picture you see there is a yellow slipper orchid, a Symprydium. Uh, that was taken out at the Arboretum. They have quite a stand of yellow Symprydiums out in the um, native plant area along one of the stream bed. They're absolutely gorgeous. Now, Julie Weisenhorn, who some of you may have heard of, for the Saturday morning garden show, Smart Gardens took that picture. So let's talk about orchids. Uh, they're found throughout the world, except in Antarctica, in Antarctica and Arctic, in the Arctic. They're mostly tropical. They're terrestrial and epiphytes, which means they live in trees. And there is a class of orchids that grows on rocks as well, but around here, you'll never see those. And they're abundant. I mean, there's 25,000 different species of orchids and they hybridize very easily. So there's over 154,000 and that number is probably up by now. That number is a couple of years old of registered hybrids. And we have 49 species of native orchids right here in Minnesota. And our showy lady slipper, that is our state flower, is an orchid. Uh, it's a Sympridium orchid. It's part of the Paphleopedliums. Now I will fully admit to you that I'm an orchidholic with no hope of redemption here. Um, I'd like to also tell you that um, the pictures that I show in here, uh, a lot of them are the orchids I had in the house. And it's not to brag, well, kind of, but it's to show you the variety of orchids you can grow in your house and have good success with them. The orchid you see in that picture is a little phalaenopsis that a friend had over on Kauai. And the orchid plant itself is only a couple of inches tall, but you can see the roots all over that tree from that little orchid. The stem you see coming out to the left of the picture there is a flower spike, but it was done, so I didn't take a picture of it. But you can see how nice and green the roots are. The, or the orchid roots photosynthesize. So they, uh, 
they're green most of the time. In fact, when you have them in your house, you want to be sure you have green roots. So let's talk some orchid myths. A lot of people shy away from orchids because there's all these myths running around and I like to dispel a few of those. One, orchids are fragile. Well, they are a very pretty flower and they do look very fragile, but they really aren't. They're pretty rugged. Uh, you look at that um, orchid that was in the tree in the previous chart. I mean, it sits there, it doesn't get water unless it gets rained on. And, you know, it doesn't get fertilized unless a bird happens to poop on its root. So that's a, that's a pretty tough customer. Orchids are hard to grow. Well, they really aren't, as you'll see by the pictures that I'm gonna show you. They, um, they depend a lot on their environment. And I'll go into that a little bit here, but they really aren't hard to grow. Orchids thrive on neglect. Well, no house plant thrives on neglect. Usually when they talk about orchids thriving on neglect, it means you don't overwater them which is the main problem with people or killing their orchids. Orchids need a greenhouse. Well, yes, some of them do. But the ones that we have in our homes, like the Paphleopedliums, the Dendrobiums, the uh, Phalaenopsis, they, they don't need a greenhouse. Orchids are parasites. Well, you see them growing on trees, but that's because they're epiphytes. They aren't parasites. They take no nutrition from the tree. They just kind of hang on for dear life on the tree. Orchids need water daily. Well, they aren't a house plant in dirt. And people see their in bark and they think, uh-oh, boy, they need to be watered just all the time to keep them moist. Well, again, that is not true. And orchids are expensive. Well, it depends on what you mean by expensive and value comes into this. I can go spend, I can go to Orchids Limited and spend $450 on an orchid. Or I can go to Home Depot and get one for 18 bucks. And you say, well, that's a lot maybe for a plant, but you consider that spending $20, $25 on a bouquet from one of the flower shops and it's gonna last you about maybe a week, week and a half. Or if you buy a nice Phalaenopsis orchid, you'll have blooms on that orchid for two to three months. So here's the list of the common orchids that you'll see in most of the stores that sell orchids. The Phalaenopsis, the moth orchid is the most common you see. That's what you see in the big box stores. There's Cattleyas, and they're on Sidiums, which are the, called the Dancing Ladies. I've got a picture of one, and you can see why that is. The Cymbidiums, that's a corsage orchid. It's pretty common. And the Paphleopedliums, which are the slipper orchids, which you've seen some pictures of. And the Dendrobiums, which they sometimes call a bamboo orchid, because its canes kind of resemble a bamboo. And they're ranked here from easy to challenging to take care of. Now I stole this chart from uh, Steve Gonzalez at the Orchid Society, I thought it was, was really good. Uh, some people will argue that Cattleyas are easier to take care of than Phalaenopsis, but uh, for the most part for your home, you're gonna wind up with Phalaenopsis orchids. So these are the various orchid types that I've mentioned. There's a, Phalaenopsis, or if you're in the in crowd, you say a fowl. Uh, there's the Paphleopedlium, otherwise known as a paph. Uh, the Dendrobium is the next one over. And then on the lower row is the Cattleya and the Oncidium, which was the dancing lady. And you can kind of see the yellow on that one as maybe being the dancer's skirt. And then the Cymbidium which is the last photo on the bottom. That is a cymbidium I have. Uh, there was a picture of it a couple of charts ago and it's currently in spike. It's got eight flower spikes on it right now. 
and it will bloom here probably in about three weeks. Can't wait for it. Now you'll notice these orchids, you know, they look very dissimilar. I mean, you compare the Paphiopedilum to the Oncidium, they're quite different flowers. And that's because <clears throat> species are grouped by the way they reproduce. Okay, so let's talk about the basics of orchid care. Uh, that's a dendrobium orchid uh, that you see in that picture. So let me give you uh, my 10 tips for success with orchids. Very first thing is right plant, right place. And that's true in gardening, uh, house plants, any type of gardening. I mean, you take a bunch of ferns and plant them in the south side of your house, those ferns are gonna struggle because that isn't the environment they like. It's not the right place. Uh, I mentioned this before, don't overwater your orchids. That's how most people kill their orchids is by overwatering them. Examine your orchid every now and then. Look at it. Make sure there aren't any creepy crawlies on it, spots on the leaves, um, maybe rotting roots, um, anything like that. Just make sure your orchid's healthy. Give it a checkup every three or four months. And repot your orchid every couple of years. And this is, again, not unique with orchids. You should repot your uh, house plants as well. But with orchids being in bark for the most part, the bark begins to decompose, just like the mulch that you use in your yard, and it becomes mush. And that mush does not dry out and it will rot the roots of the orchid. And like I said, uh, don't overwater your orchid. That's really tempting. People see that bark in there and Oh my gosh, I, I have to water it, I have to water it. The orchids actually do need to dry out a little bit before you water them again. Oh yeah, and uh, don't overwater your orchid. Orchids need to be fertilized and then flushed. Now that's not like the goldfish that died. Um, you need to fertilize, and I'll talk about fertilization. And then once a month, which is what I do, you need to run fresh water through them. And that is to flush out any of the fertilizer salts that begin to accumulate in the uh, potting medium, whether it, be, whether it be bark or whether it be uh, sphagnum moss. But you really do need to flush them. And in case I haven't mentioned it, don't overwater your orchid. Uh, they say it's really tempting because they're in bark and they feel dry. So I, have to, I have to water it. And let the orchid rest. After blooming, an orchid has expended a lot of energy. And there are ways, and I talk about this in a class I give, <clears throat> where you can um, get an orchid to rebloom in the same bloom cycle because most orchids and there are exceptions to this only bloom once a year and it's best to let the orchid rest and recover and so it can begin to uh, produce more flower shoots the way you can tell that the orchid's coming out of rest you'll see new leaves forming you'll see a new flower spike and that's when the orchid's ready to go for another season and of course, last but not least on the list is don't overwater your orchid. Okay, so let's uh, talk about selecting an orchid because that's where it all starts. You, you need to get a good plant to begin with. Now what you see in that picture is the Walmart in Lihue, Kauai. I go in there when we go over there and have to buy a couple of orchids to have in the condo. I spend a little time in there, as you can imagine. I get uh, kind of orchid overload and analysis paralysis when I'm in there. But what you see are mostly dendrobiums and phalaenopsis and cattleyas. 
And there's another side to that stand that has the same number of orchids on it. It's just really fun to be in there. Well, the first thing in selecting an orchid is where's it going to be in the house? In other words, we're talking right place here. So you are uh, going to have it in a sunny location. Well, then maybe you want to uh, look at an Oncidium or a Cattleya. If it's going to be in the north side of the house or say an east window, then you probably want something like a Phalaenopsis. And then examine your plant. Look at the leaves. Are they firm? Are they green? Are they spot free? In other words, they haven't got any diseases on them to begin with. And then check out the planting medium, whether it's in bark or sphagnum moss, and is it moist? Has the orchid dried out? That's what you're looking for here. And then look at the look at the roots. Now, most orchids you're going to buy are in plastic pots, and and they have a ceramic pot around them. But pull them out of the pot and check the roots. You should see the lots of roots. You want lots of roots. Uh, they should be green or maybe cream colored. Uh, you don't want them to be brown or black. And look at the flower stalks. Are they green? Are there a lot of buds? And make sure the flowers are alive. Um, that's what uh, you, know, you can. Look, you might see a couple of flowers that don't look so good. Well, there might be something wrong with the orchid if that's the case. So you want to make sure the flowers are all alive. And you want to find out shelf time if you can. The reason that's important is if you're buying a orchid from the big box stores, um, you really know how need to know how long that orchid has been on the shelf because most of those come wrapped with a cellophane thing and bows or they come in a package and they can't water them. So they tend to dry out. And what you want to do is get them when they come in before they've had a chance to sit on the shelves for more than a couple of days. The Last time I was over at Home Depot and bought an orchid as a gift, they had just opened the box and I got to pick them right out of the box. And if you talk to some of the employees there, maybe they can uh, tell you when the next shipment might be coming in. But the really important thing is to buy buds, not blossoms. The, if you buy a orchid that is fully bloomed out, you don't know when that orchid started to bloom. And it may be at the end of its bloom cycle. So you're probably gonna have flowers for maybe a week and they're gonna start dying. If you buy one that has a few flowers on it so you can see what color it is, but lots of buds, <clears throat> you're gonna have an orchid in bloom for probably two to three months. I bought an orchid and it was at Home Depot some years ago and the pot turned out had two plants in it. And I had flowers on those orchids for nine months. Now that's an exception. You know, it hasn't happened, but it's not uncommon for Phalaenopsis to have orchids flowers for almost uh, three months. <clears throat> so fowls are fun. Uh, this is a good orchid to start with. They're readily available. You can find them anywhere um, because they're mass produced. Uh, some of the orchid houses and growers in California ship literally millions of Phalaenopsis a year and there are a lot of imports from Taiwan. That picture I took in Lyon, France, the orchids are everywhere. That was in a flower shop. And the price of those orchids was about the same as they are here. As you can see from the picture, they come in many colors and they do well indoors. <clears throat> and part of that is because they grow in trees at the lower limbs of the trees. So they're in the shade most of the time. 
So they're used to not having a lot of light. And they're, as I said before in the earlier in the presentation, they're pretty rugged epiphytes. <clears throat> Say they, they survive with uh, just water whenever it rains and that's it. And they're reasonably priced. Their prices are going up, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but they uh, used to be eight dollars and they're up to about 18 now. One time Home Depot had them on sale for five bucks. And I did uh, increase my collection a little bit on that sale. So I've talked about watering and it's the key to success. The, uh, there are three things to understand, when, how, and with, with what. Now the orchid you see in the picture there has a little bit of history behind it. Uh, a neighbor of mine passed on 12-12-12 uh, and he had some orchids and his wife gave them to me and that cymbidium was one of them. And it took a second year, I guess, before they bloomed again, but it spiked and the bud set. And that was in, oh, maybe late October, early November. And the buds just sat there. And I thought, boy, if that orchid blooms on 12-12, I am gonna freak. However, it didn't, it bloomed in January. But anyway, let's, let's talk about, um, when we should do, <clears throat> when we should water. Well, it depends. Now that's real helpful, right? You just water them whenever they need it. So that provides uh, not much guidance. So it depends on the pot size and type. So usually you've got plastic pots and you've got terracotta pots. The clay pots absorb water. So orchid plants that are in clay need to be watered a little more often than orchids that are in plastic pots. Because the plastic, of course, doesn't absorb any water. Now, one of the members of the Orchid Society who grew fantastic orchids, she potted in nothing but clay. And uh, she had great success with it, but she knew how to take care of it. You'll also notice in those pots, there's a lot of drain holes. And uh, that's so the orchids drain so they don't sit in water. It also depends on the medium. Um, bark, medium, requires a little more watering than sphagnum moss. And when my orchids are outside in the summer, the ones that are in sphagnum moss, they may get watered uh, two or three times in a summer and that's it because the sphagnum moss doesn't dry out because we've got humidity. And it depends on the time of year. We have a unique situation here in the winter where our houses are very, very dry and so when your orchids are in the house, they will dry out fairly quickly, particularly if they're in small pots. And you have to be care very careful <clears throat> with the small pots to water them a little more often. So when do you water? Well, you can check the medium. You know, there's a chopstick method or use a pencil and stick it down in the medium and see if it comes back moist. Um, I tell people, you learn to feel the pot. When the pot, pot feels dry, you water it. The way to do that is take a pot of the same size, fill it with dry medium and feel it. And then wet it and feel it again. And you can tell the weight difference. It's amazing. In sphagnum moss, it's not very difficult to tell when the sphagnum is dry because the pot weighs almost nothing. So the rule of thumb is you water orchids and bark 
on a weekly basis, generally speaking, and sphag them every two to three weeks, and sometimes longer than that, depending on where you've got uh, the orchid situated. That orchid you see in that picture is a psychopsis orchid. It's kind of interesting. Um, you can't see it in the picture, but there is a bud at the end of that stem and that bud will not open until that first flower dies. And then it will begin to regenerate and another shoot will come out it just keeps growing. <laughs> they have one up at Orchids Limited they've had for about five years and the spike is about six feet long. But anyway, when in doubt, if you aren't sure, well, just wait a day or two. Uh, you aren't gonna kill your orchid if it doesn't get watered for a couple of days. So how to water, how do I water my orchid? <clears throat> well, I tend to do it early in the day, uh, just so the leaves have time to dry out during the day if you get them wet. The techniques you can use, you can just hold it under the faucet if you're using tap water. Um, you can pour the water through the medium, which is what I'm doing. But if you do that, you have to pour it through about four or five times because the bark is dry and it needs to absorb some water before it begins to absorb more water. It's kind of like a dry sponge. You know, you need the sun, the, the sponge moist before uh, you can wipe up water with it. Or you can set the medium, the pot, in a bowl and let it soak up from the bottom. This is the way I happen to work or water now. It's easiest for me because I've got so many of them. And then once you're done watering, you let the pot drain um, before you stick it back in a decorative pot or wherever you've got it because you don't want it to sit in water. And if you're doing a phalaenopsis, you need to get any water out of the crown. The crown is where the leaves come into the main stalk. And if you leave water in there, sometimes you'll get uh, crown rot. It's a fungal disease. So what do you water with? I mean, that sounds like kind of silly. Well, it isn't really. <laughs> There's a lot of options. For them to be exact, rainwater or melted snow. I use rainwater in the summer and then I actually melt snow in the winter to have water for my orchids. They really respond to natural water like that. Uh, my wife's hobby is winemaking. So I have a lot of five gallon buckets. And after we get a snow, I go out and fill them up and take them down to the basement and let the snow melt. Most of you have heard the phrase, don't eat yellow snow. Don't eat any snow. Uh, it is amazing. When that snow melts, there is a gray scum on the top of the water. And there is a gray scum right at the water level. Uh, when the, uh, the uh, as the water starts to evaporate a little bit, it does leave a scum on the side of the bucket. Uh, it's really greasy. And it's, it's all the particulates that these the water picks up on its way down to the ground. Uh, you can use tap water, it's not the best. Uh, it's not the best because one, it contains chlorine, so you usually want to let it set for 24 hours before you use it. And I always add about a tablespoon of white vinegar to tap water if I have to use it because the water we, we have in our taps is alkaline and Orchids like a little more acidic water. So a couple of tablespoons and a couple of gallons of water will reduce the pH, get it down closer to either neutral or maybe a little acidic. <clears throat> and you can use distilled water, which you can buy off the shelf, or RO water, which is the water you usually get if you go buy water in bulk. Um, you bring in your own jugs and fill them at some place like Valley Co-op or something like that, Cub. But with those water, types of water, you need to add fertilizer always because of the filtration process, they lose some of the micronutrients. 
and use warm water. You remember orchids are tropical for the most part. And so they aren't used to having a lot of cold water on their roots, which a lot of people think, well, yeah, but well, what about ice cube orchids? Okay. You know, the ones you buy and they, uh, they tell you to put three, three ice cubes on them once a week. Well, we've talked about not overwatering your orchid. And that's what they're trying to do is to not get you to overwater your orchid because three ice cubes does not have a lot of water. Uh, what I would recommend is that you uh, melt the ice cubes, warm the water, and then water it very slowly into the orchid. Um, <laughs> you know, the idea of putting ice on the roots of orchids, uh, you know, is just counter counterintuitive. What I would say is if you can stick the ice cubes around between the roots, that, that would be better. But whatever you do, don't ever use softened water. You know, most of the water in our taps is hard water, cold water taps particularly. But softened water contains salt and if you wanna kill your orchid, uh, that will do it. So let's talk about fertilizing now. You can use a, any well-balanced fertilizer. Um, you know, I show a picture there of some of them. Some of them are fairly common like Miracid or Miracle Grow. Um, a fellow who was giving a presentation one time when I was over in Kauai said that uh, Miracid was developed initially as an orchid fertilizer. And if you compare its content, its makeup, to any other orchid fertilizer, you will find they're very, very similar. But there's a couple of approaches here. You can water at full strength with the fertilizer every two weeks, or you can water weekly, weekly, which is what I do. And it's half strength, but water weekly. And then once a month, I flush my orchids. I just run tap water through them. And that's to avoid any salt buildup. You can stay on a regular fertilizing schedule, but after the orchid has bloomed and has lost its, its flowers and you've cut down the flower stock, uh, you can reduce the fertilization and let the orchid rest. And then you pick it up again and the orchid shows signs of it's ready to go, new leaves, new roots, that sort of thing. You also need to provide a little humidity for your orchids because orchids perspire water and so they need some humidity. And you can imagine from where they grow, they usually, you know, there's a lot of humidity. Adding humidity in an open area like your house is not easy, particularly in the winter. You don't want to do that because you'll wind up with condensation on your windows. But here's a couple of approaches. You can use humidity trays. Uh, they aren't particularly stylish and might, might not fit the decor of your house. They're basically a tray that's about a foot and a half wide, about oh, two and a half, three feet long with a mesh on the top, plastic grid. And you fill them with water, then as the water evaporates, it goes by the leaves and the roots and provides some humidity. Uh, you can um, put pebbles in a saucer. You can go to any hobby store and get pebbles or garden center and then fill the, uh, the tray underneath the pebbles with water. And again, as the water evaporates, you, you get some humidity to your orchid. Some people are tempted to mist them. I felt that led to fungal infections. Um, just it doesn't seem right. I do when my orchids are outside in the summer, I do hit them with the spray. But again, they're outside. <clears throat> and most of it will tend to evaporate quickly. But whatever you do, don't let the orchid sit in water. A lot of people have done that. They, well, it's, you know, I don't have to water it so much. It'll just soak up from the bottom as it needs it. Well, it doesn't. And the medium never gets dry. The roots stay too wet and you're effectively overwatering them and the roots will rot and you will kill your orchid.
then uh-oh, my orchid died. Uh-oh, now what? Well, look at this as a learning opportunity. Try and find out what happened. It may be you put the wrong plant in the wrong place. You know, go back to, you know, did you put a phalian office in bright sunlight? Um, did you uh, burn the leaves, take it outside, not harden it off? You know, there's something you, you could have, you might have done there. So examine the plant a little bit. Look at the roots, are they rotted? Like what you see in the picture there. Um, what's the plant medium look like? Is it decomposed, is it mushy? Which again means you probably should have repotted the orchid or you've been overwatering it. And look at the leaves, are there spots? Is the crown black? That's called crown rot, it's a fungal disease. Again, it's uh, probably keeping water in the crown too much and do some research. Uh, I've included in the, in the handout several uh, internet sites where you can do some diagnostics on uh, orchids, uh, orchid diseases in particular that may help you identify. But all we can say is welcome to the club. If you are gonna keep orchids, you're gonna lose some orchids. It just comes with the territory. And like somebody told me about their um, bone size, you know, sometimes your friends die and it just happens. It could have been a bad orchid in the first place. Well, it isn't necessarily your fault. But again, try and make it a learning experience. Uh, learn about the orchid. Uh, there are care sheets for almost any orchid you'd ever have that is, are on the American Orchid Society website. And again, that's in the handout, what that website is. So let's talk about a KISS method, keep it simple. Uh, that orchid is a Phragopedium orchid. Now, strangely enough, that orchid needs to sit in some water because they like really wet conditions. So start out by buying a Phalaenopsis, buy one in a plastic pot, and buy one in sphagnum moss. You buy the plastic pot so that too much water doesn't get soaked into say a clay, like a clay pot. And the sphagnum moss you get so you don't have to water very much. And put them in an east or southeast window, uh, most, any orchid you're going to get, particularly a Phalaenopsis, they will, uh, they're very happy in an east or southeast window. My orchids happen to be in a southeast window. I have no southern exposure anyway. So that isn't a possibility for me. And water with tap water. But make sure the water's at room temperature. Don't water them with cold water. And then fertilize. Fertilize at half strength flush occasionally, and that orchid should last you uh, for quite some time if you're careful with it. Again, you know, you give it time to rest, uh, you inspect it, you know, all the things I talked about uh, in the previous charts, but you, that isn't a lot of trouble to take care of that orchid, say, particularly if it's a Phalaenopsis, and you should be pretty successful. All right, so in summary, orchids make great showy house plants. They're readily available. You can get them, you know, at Home Depot, Trader Joe's, Bachman's, Gertens, most anywhere. The big thing is right plant, right place. Is you've got to buy an orchid that fits where you're going to put it. Uh, one easy way, and there are a lot of exceptions to this, but you can look at the orchid's leaves and tell you, it will tell you whether that orchid likes sun or not. Uh, if you look at a Phalaenopsis leaves, they're wide and thick. And that's because 
they're in the shade and so they need to absorb as much sunlight as they possibly can. Where you take a sun-loving orchid like a cymbidium, the leaves are narrow because they don't need to absorb that light. They've got a lot of sunlight. So that's, that's one rule of thumb you could try. So the fowls are the easiest for indoors. They're low light, they're long blooming. I mean, you can have an orchid at a fallian office that will rebloom and you will have blooms for two to three months easily. The care is not difficult. It really isn't. Say I gave you a kind of a simple method. It's just a little different. You have to be a little more careful. Um, you have to pay a little attention to them, but it's, it's not difficult. And as I said before, watering is the key to success. You've got to keep the orchid so that it does not sit in water, the roots uh, are not continually wet. They actually do need to dry out. But I will tell you that orchids can become addicting. I mean, it is amazing. I had a few orchids for quite a while and then, uh-oh, ooh, that's a pretty one. Oh, I got to have that one. And all of a sudden you've got 10 or 20 of them. And I have more than that, but I'm getting, uh, my old age, I'm starting to cull. Orchids that I haven't had bloom in a couple of years, I uh, am starting to get rid of. Let me put in a plug here for the Winter Carnival Orchid Show, which we had a reduced show last January. Um, that's one of the exhibits. There's several thousand orchids on exhibit. It's during the Winter Carnival and it's at McNeely Conservatory in Como Park. And we run it uh, Saturday and Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And it's an American Orchid Society judged event. We actually bring judges in from the Orchid Society um, to judge the orchids. Uh, the Orchid Society of Minnesota sponsors it. And it's a lot of fun. You, I go around and uh, help with the judges uh, I'm kind of a gopher, but they explain to you a lot about the orchids when you're doing it. So it's quite an educational experience. Plus, of course, we have orchid vendors to tempt you to uh, add to your collection or maybe start your collection. Okay, so that concludes my presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Well, these are questions that we got on the chat and I'll go through them one by one and we'll, we'll get, get them answered. Uh, the first one was, how long do you let an orchid rest? Remember in the talk, I talked about letting orchids rest. Uh, the orchid will tell you when it's ready to stop resting and it will do that by sending out new leaves, uh, new flower spikes, uh, new roots that will tell you that it's active. And once that happens, then you can begin to fertilize the orchid again and get it to flower. I have one phalaenopsis here that uh, I think you can see it. Uh, it's got a new leaf coming right here. So this orchid has come out of rest now and will try and nurture it and hopefully to get it to spike. Now I had another question on how to display your orchids. Well, uh, I'm a windowsill grower and I have lights in the basement. So my orchids are displayed on the windowsill. Uh, what I do is I keep most of them under the lights and let them spike and bud and as soon as they start to flower, then I bring them upstairs so that we can show off the flowers. The, uh, some of the other orchids, the Cattleyas and those, I will leave upstairs because they get a little more sunlight. But by and large, most of them are down under lights and then I bring them up when they begin to flower. There was a next question was, what are some good orchid houses around the country? 
Well, we have a couple of good local ones. One of them's Orchids Limited up in Plymouth. And then there's Sophie's Orchids, which is in Minneapolis. And they're mail order only. Orchids Limited, you can actually call up there. You can't go into the greenhouses anymore, but you can order orchids and they'll bring them out for you. A couple of outstate orchid houses are Hausermann's and Nate's Orchids. They're in the Chicago area. There's Gold Country Orchids and Sunset Valley Orchids that are in California, both good suppliers. There's a company called Big Leaf Orchids in Texas, and you can imagine they specialize in Phalaenopsis orchids. And then there's New World Orchids, and they're in Michigan. All of those are really good houses uh, to purchase orders up or orchids online. Uh, the next question is why do orchids lose their lower leaves? Well, this is pretty true of Phalaenopsis, and they will slough the lower leaves. They'll just turn yellow and fall off. Uh, you can help them along by cutting them off if you want, if you don't like the way the plant looks. But it's just part of their natural process. If the orchid starts losing leaves up the stalks or on the top, then you have an orchid that's probably got a disease of some kind. That's when you want to be concerned. The next question was, do orchids survive in a north window? Well, that's a shady environment. And your best bet with an orchid like that or with those type of growing conditions would be a Phalaenopsis because they're a low light orchid. That doesn't mean they can grow with no light at all, but they don't like direct sunlight. So a north window is really not too bad. If I kept it in the north window, I would be tempted to take it outside once the temperatures get above 50 in the 60s and give it some sunlight, a little bit of sunlight, to let it kind of uh, rejuvenate itself. But say a Phalaenopsis should work okay in a north window. Most of mine are in a southeast window, so they get some morning sun, get no hot afternoon sun. Uh, the last question was, is there a good reason to trim orchid roots? And the answer is there is no good reason to trim orchid roots. They're part of the plant. Uh, people think the air roots that come out on Phalaenopsis orchids are ugly. I've had that happen in a class. And if you cut those off, you're going to damage the plant because the plant is getting nutrients through those, through those roots. Okay, so that was, that was the questions we had. I wanted to show you an orchid that I picked up at one of the big box stores as an example of an orchid you shouldn't buy and give you something to you can look at. Um, this is a Phalaenopsis orchid. And the first thing you'll notice, remember I talked about the leaves being nice and stiff and firm. These are not stiff and firm. They're flaccid, okay? This means the orchid is probably not getting enough moisture to the leaves. And I don't know whether you'd be able to see this or not, but if you look at those roots, they aren't green and they aren't gray, they're black. And uh, that means it's got root rot going on. Okay, this orchid probably will not survive. Uh, when I bought it, it actually had dead flower buds on it which have since fallen off. But if you look at some of these flowers, see this one here, you can see there's dead petals on it. So say this is just an example of an orchid you really shouldn't, shouldn't buy. And it drives home the point of before you buy an orchid, be sure you look at that orchid and make sure it's healthy because that gives you a running start to have that orchid for several years. Um, I'm gonna try and save this orchid just because I find it fun to do that. I'll probably take it out of the sphagnum moss, uh, do it in bark, 
and see if I can bring it around. Um, I figure I might have a 50-50 chance. But uh, anyway, say this is a good example of why you need to check an organ out before you buy it.